going to begin with the Psalm 100, please, on the page 91 in your hymn book, the first version, all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. As you're finding your place, let me say it's good to be back, good to see each one in the house of God on such a colder and wintry morning, and we trust the Lord will bless us as we gather in his house today. But let's really sing to the glory of God, Psalm 100, the first version, and standing after the introduction. wonderful singing. Now we'll come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. So let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come into the Master's presence together. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the opportunity to gather in Thy house this Sabbath day. And Father, Thou knowest the uh, cold and the wintry weather and the icy roads and all of those things. And we thank Thee for bringing each one to the house of God safely. We thank Thee for allowing us to be found in this place to worship Thee corporately in this wonderful manner and to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. And we thank Thee for what we have been able to sing. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. And we pray that that help us to do that today. 
And we thank Thee for the God that we serve. We praise Thee that we do not serve a God that is dead. We thank Thee that our Savior is no longer in the tomb. We thank Thee that we are not coming unto a God made of wood or of stone or of men's hands. We thank Thee that we do not have any cause whatsoever to be thoroughly miserable in our worship, but we should come with gladness and with joy and with rejoicing on our lips and in our hearts. And we pray that that make us a happy people, realizing that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord, we do fully acknowledge that there are people with, with sorrows, with burdens, with hardships, with sicknesses, Thou knowest those even in the hospital ward, even at this very moment, and we pray for them. We pray that thou bless them, undertake for their need, give them that healing touch that they require, and bring them back to their homes and back to the pew in time. And we ask that thou do it very soon. O oh Lord, we pray that even now those that would love to be at the house of God joined with us, that thou bless them and give them the joy of the Lord, even as they listen privately to thy word or open up the scriptures for themselves on this, the Sabbath day. But, O oh God, we do pray that thou would help us to, to be a happy people, realizing that the Lord has done so much for us, realizing that in our sin we deserve the hottest hell, realizing in our sin we deserve wrath, we deserve judgment, we deserve damnation, and yet through Christ, we possess so much. We know because he rose that we too will rise one day because he uh, put on immortality and has everlasting life that we too, those of us that are saved, will one day put on immortality and have everlasting life. We thank thee because he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven's glory that we too one day will enter into heaven's glory and we thank Thee that even now, because He prays for us, and because He has made a way, that our prayers will be heard and answered before the throne of the Father. And we rejoice at all of the doings of our precious Savior. And we do declare with Solomon of old, yea, He is altogether lovely. And we thank Thee for each one that can say from the depth of their being, this is my beloved, and this is my friend. And Lord, we especially remember those today that are in our midst without Christ, without the Savior, those that know all about Christ, know about the cross, know about the shed blood. They know what they must do in order to be saved, repenting and believing the gospel. And yet for so long they've put it off, maybe said another day, another day. Oh, Father, we pray that they would hear the words of the hymn writer and be in time, be in time, while the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. Oh God, save souls today. We thank thee for the mercy drops in recent weeks and months. We thank thee for souls that have been saved. It, it does our hearts good to hear of, uh, of the cries of the newborn babe in that sense. We pray that thou make money slain free Presbyterian church a great spiritual maternity ward where men and women are born again of the Spirit of God, where many souls are saved by thy might and by thy power. And do that work today, Lord. Do it in this hour. Lord, we're, we're, we're impatient for thy glory. We long to see some man, some woman, some young person, some child come through for Christ today and give them help to do so. But Lord, bless us as we gather around thy word. Speak to every heart. Thou knowest every condition, every, every burden, those that need encouragement. Thou knowest those that maybe need a word of rebuke or challenge. Oh God, speak to our hearts. And we pray that every soul under the ministry of the word today may be in no doubt whatsoever as they leave this place, saying, the Lord spoke to me tonight, today. The Lord spoke to my heart. Don't know if he spoke to anyone else, but I know he spoke to me. Oh, God, give us a word in season. Bless us in a wonderful way. We ask these things in and through the Savior's precious name. Amen. Hymn number 341, please. 341, page number uh, 314. Someday we'll stand before the judgment bar 
the quick, the risen dead, the Lord will then make known the record there. Our names will all be read. 341, let's stand together as we sing, please. That's wonderful singing. And one day we will, will all stand before the judgment bar, but I trust you as you stand before Christ that day will be able to answer when they call your name. Praise God, I'm saved through Jesus' blood. Now we're going to turn in the Scriptures of Truth together, please. We're turning to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 and the verse, uh, verses 1 to 23. We'll read the whole chapter together. In a moment, we're going to be focusing our thoughts on the verses 11 and 12, looking at the title, The Truth Will Out. The Truth Will Out. And we find Paul's advice for the church here in Romans 14. We find that essentially we're not to fall out over secondary issues. You know, some people can have their, their hobby horses and get very het up about it. But the Apostle Paul warns against that, and rather to encourage one another. And if someone isn't quite just where they should be, to put an arm around them, not to fall out with them, but to help them. But Romans 14, let's read from the verse 1, the word of the Lord. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak, uh, who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him not which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. Then he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, 
we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. At this point in the service, let me bid each one a very warm welcome in the Savior's name. It's lovely to see each one, especially those visiting with us today. And we thank you for coming out on a very slippery uh, day on the foot, and we appreciate you coming, and we trust the Lord will bless as we meet around the scriptures of truth this morning. Please remember the gospel service at 7 p.m., and that is preceded by a time of prayer at 6.30. The Reverend Andrew Murray from our Adara congregation will be coming along to preach the word. I'll be in Kilkeel tonight, but I trust you'll remember him and myself as we come to preach the word of the Lord, but please do remember that tonight. Then for the week ahead of us on Wednesday at 8 p.m. is the prayer meeting and Bible study. And I trust you'll be found in your place. Don't be a stranger to the prayer meeting, but do come along. And I know, I trust it will be a time of blessing for your soul. And then on Friday, the Youth Fellowship, we're going back to Market Hill to have a joint fellowship night and a Christmas party. And uh, we'll be leaving the church here 7 p.m. sharp once again to be in good time. So young people, please remember that. And if you can, bring others along as well for that. 7 p.m. here Friday. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45. Then the morning worship, 12 noon, preceded by a half hour of prayer. Then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. And next Sunday night, we'll take the form of our carol service. And it's a service that uh, we look forward to. It's a wonderful time. There'll be supper after that service. With that in mind, if I could ask the ladies maybe to stay behind after the evening service uh, tonight to prepare for that. But please do invite others along. You know, there's often many an individual in a district that would only come to church at, uh, at weddings and funerals and at Christmas and Easter time. So use that opportunity and invite them along to the carol service as we endeavor to preach Christ to their souls, trusting that the Lord will save them through the preaching of his word. But especially remember that, uh, Sunday night, 7 p.m. Now today, as you leave, there's the special Sabbath school offering for Nepal. So please remember that. Please do add to the Sabbath school's offering if you can, and let's really encourage that work in that land. And then next Lord's Day will be the Whitfield College Covenant offering. Please remember Sam Houston's CDs and DVDs at the door. 
The Christmas one, £10. The other CD, £12. The DVD, £13. They'd make a lovely Christmas gift. I trust you'll avail yourselves of the opportunity. And also the LTBS calendars are £5 there at the door as well. And as the year, the new year is coming upon us, please do take those with you. We also have a, a prayer update for the work in Kenya. And I'd like each one to take one of these, please. Very detailed report, and it will help us to uh, uh, pray more intelligently for the work out there. And I trust you'll remember that. These are prayer requests received for December uh, 2022. And please take those as you leave. And let me remind the elders that the next session meeting is due to be held on Monday the 19th uh, at 8 p.m. Therefore, any items uh, for the agenda need to be submitted before Saturday, please. And do continue to pray for those that are, are sick and laid aside at this time. There seems to be a number that are not too well in recent days, some in the hospital ward as well. Please remember them. Please remember those shut in as well. They'd love to be out and about, especially in these wintry conditions, and they can't. Remember them all, especially those bereaved of late as well. Times these folks can, can leave our memory after funerals are finished and all of those things. Remember them. But of course, all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. We're going to have our offering hymn now. Hymn number 77. 77, page number 206. We'll keep our seats for the first part as we sing... Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. Hymn number 77, keeping our seats for the first. Turning in the Word of God together, please, back to that portion we read earlier, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 and the verses 11 and 12. 
is our text for today. Romans 14, verse 11 states, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. With our Bibles open before the Lord, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together, please. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for uh, our singing of praise unto Thy name. We thank Thee that there is now joy to the world because the Lord did come. We thank Thee that He died upon the tree. And even though it was a terribly dark hour, yet still it was a joyous hour because at that moment the devil was finally defeated, sin was defeated, death was defeated, all of the enemies of Christ defeated. What a joyful moment. We thank Thee that our Saviour is resurrected, ascended, and He's coming again to rule the world. And what a truth that is. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. But, O oh God, help us now as we look at these truths concerning the judgment seat of Christ. Help us to be aware of how we are to live with this in view. And we pray that Thou'd speak to each one of our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at the title, The Truth Will Out. The Truth Will Out. Often it's said, and I'm sure some of the young people are maybe fed up of hearing it, school days are the best days of your life. I'm sure all of us remember being told that at some point or another. I'm sure some of the older ones like saying it as well. The school days are the best days of your life. And I know I never used to like hearing that because I must confess I couldn't wait to leave school and still years on after leaving school I hold the same opinion. I'm glad I'm not back in school and I didn't view school days as the best days of my life. You know when I left I went to uh, tech, became a joiner and I said at that point I'll never do another exam again and the Lord called me to the Whitfield College ended up doing more exams than I'd ever done in my life, done over 90 exams in four years, and it's funny how the Lord has his own ways. But some of you may remember from school days studying Shakespeare, and more specifically his play, The Merchant of Venice. That is the first time this phrase was used, the truth will out. The truth will out. And maybe you ask, what does that mean? It simply means the truth will be made public. The truth will come out eventually one day. Now maybe there's some here and you feel terribly grieved. Maybe you feel someone has done a wrong on you. Someone has done something on you. And maybe it just feels like you're the only one that knows the truth. No one else has a clue about the truth. Everyone else thinks that person is just splendid and you know everything about them and you know it's just not what everyone thinks and maybe you too are that individual that has a, a life of show and everyone thinks you're doing well but maybe, maybe you're actually living a sinful life. I want to remind everyone in earshot today that one day the truth will out. The truth will out. One day the truth will be made public. Come over the page to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans 12 and the verse 19. <clears throat> it tells us that with this in view, that the truth will out and the truth will be made public one day. It says in Romans 12 and the verse 19 that we are not to hold vengeance against that person. We are to leave it in the hands of the Lord because it says in Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place, uh, uh, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So it's not our job to seek revenge. It's not our job to be vengeful. It's not our job to get one over on that person. In fact, we've got to do something that is actually very, very difficult indeed. We have to leave it to the Lord, knowing that the Lord will deal with these things in his own time and the truth will out. You know, it reminds me of Genesis 18 and we have to leave it as Abraham was able to leave it by saying, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
One day the judge will come. One day each one will stand before the judgment bar. One day all of us will give an account of ourselves and we need to leave those things to the Lord. And therefore we find in John 13 and the verse 34 how we are to behave in the meantime when it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's not easy. That's not easy to do, especially when you feel someone has deeply and sincerely wronged me. But you know, the Word of God tells us the best thing you can do for actually pouring coals upon their head is to, is to love them and to show them the mercy that they are undeserving of. And with that in mind, when you ask, well, when will this happen? When will the truth out? When will it all be made public? When, when will all these things finally be dealt with? Well, Romans 14 and the verses 11 and 12, our text, it tells us exactly when the truth will out. Then it says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, here we find in the context of Romans 14 that the church at Rome, that's the church that Paul is writing to, the book of Romans, of course. He's writing to both Jews and Gentiles. There are some that are Gentiles, some that are Romans, naturally, as they find themselves in Rome. Some are also Jews. And we find, especially in chapter 14, that, that Paul is addressing some disputes. He, he's addressing the, the Jews that are saved and the Gentiles that are saved, but largely the Jews that are saved they're wanting to carry on the ceremonial law. They're, they're keeping up with the various dietary laws and observing this day and that day and, and things that aren't fundamental to salvation in our day. And we find Paul is saying, you don't dispute over this. That's why we read that chapter and you may have struggled to realize what was going on at the time, but we read about eating and what not to eat and how to eat and if the Lord will receive him for eating it in days to observe. And, and Paul is dealing with these disputes saying, don't fall out over secondary issues. Don't fall out over things that essentially don't matter. Look at the verse 6 with me, please. It says in the verse 6 of chapter 14, he that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth, it, uh, doth not regard it he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Paul is saying you can do both of these things essentially as long as you're doing it to the glory of God, as long as sole ideal glory is your mentality as you do it. And then there's this ultimate reminder in the verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Don't be falling out over this. Don't be causing division and squabbling in the church. Don't be destroying the unity of the congregation at the church in Rome. Why dost thou judge thy brother? For why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's saying, essentially, the truth will out. The truth will out. And it will all be made public one day. But then as we come to the verse 11, we find something very interesting. So serious and so solemn is this that, that you know, some people would try and deny that there is going to be a judgment seat. Some would deny that they have to stand before the Lord. In fact, when you see the way people live their lives in society today and the way people in government and all the rest of it make laws, you'd really think they, they don't know that they've got to stand before the righteous judge one day. But here we find that a solemn oath is given that this day is definitely going to take place. Look at the verse 11. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord. Well, does the Lord live? Of course he lives. You see the verse over my head. Uh, look what it says, a wonderful verse. One of my favorites, I am alive forevermore. The Lord will never die again. And the Lord gives an oath even on his own life, saying, I will never die again. And as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And when it says, for it is written, it's referring to Isaiah 49, where it's also written there. But then let's look at these verses together. 
Let's look at these verses. Verses 11 and 12. Really looking at this phrase. Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I want you to note three things with me today. I want you to note number one, the submission. Number two, the confession. And number three, the revelation. So number one, the submission. The submission. Look what it says in the verse 11. Every knee shall bow to me. Every knee shall bow to me. To me, I don't think there's anyone here that will really disagree with me when I say this, but we live in a day and generation of unbent knees. We live in a day and generation when people see Christ, they hear of Christ, they hear of the cross, they hear of the blood, they hear of, of everything to do with the Savior concerning the gospel, and all they have to do is repent and believe the gospel. Essentially, all they have to do is bend the knee in submission to Christ. And they turn their backs on Him, and they say, I refuse to bend the knee. We live in a day and generation of unbended knee. And I'll give you an instance of this. Yesterday morning, I was sat in... Birkenhead in Liverpool waiting on the boat uh, and uh, I was quite astonished really there was some music playing in the terminal and obviously someone had put some Christmas music on but uh, it must have whatever way it jumped to more music or jumped onto some form of Christian music when I say Christian music I say it loosely not the type of music I would recommend to anyone to listen to but as I walked in the door it started in, in this loud volume that, that Jesus Christ is Lord Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee should bow and every tongue should confess and I finished getting <laughs> my ticket off to the man and the security man sort of went over and oh I'm turning that off turning that off why? because even in those words those brief sentences he said I don't want to do that I will not bend the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, really, it's nothing new. I was reading while I was away uh, two books, one on the Countess of, of Huntingdon. And she, she bemoaned how even in her day in the 1700s, how, how people went to church, people were very religious, people went on a Sunday morning, they had a Bible, they wore a suit, they, they looked like Christians, they talked like Christians, and yet Monday through to Saturday, they lived the most immoral lives. They weren't Christians at all. In fact, I was reading another book on William Wilberforce, how in the 1700s, and as slavery was then abolished in, in 1808, how, how so-called evangelical people, people who were meant to be Christians, could somehow advocate the barbarity of slavery. And it was really down to just a, a, a fictional Christianity in their lives. They pretended to be Christians. They thought they were Christians, but they weren't saved people, and they didn't want to obey the book. You see, we live in a day and generation where people, they don't want to submit to the Savior. They don't want to submit to Christ. But I warn you, sinner friend, I, I warn firstly the sinner, you need to bend the knee while there's time. You must come to Christ while there's time. We're in the book of Romans. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 exposes our sin and exposes who we are before God. And ultimately, friend, the very fact that you have an opportunity before the Lord comes again to submit your life to Christ, surrender to Christ, say, uh, say that, that you will repent and believe the gospel. It's a wonderful gospel opportunity. And we read in Romans 3 in the verse 23, your condition, your sin, my sin, it says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want to tell you this, everyone looking this way a moment, we don't deserve the opportunity to bend the knee. We don't deserve to be in the presence of Christ. We don't deserve to even have the opportunity to declare, to declare his name. We don't deserve the opportunity to be saved. And yet we find in our sin and in our shortcomings and in our, our lawlessness still, we have the opportunity to be saved. Romans 6.23 warns us of what we deserve. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. It's what we merit. We don't deserve a split second to even get on our knee. We deserve eternal damnation immediately. But the very fact God has given you breathing room to even bend the knee shows his mercy to your soul. And it goes on to say, but the gift of God, the gift of God to your soul, sinner friend, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then if we're still in Romans, come with me to Romans 10 
and the verse 13. Maybe you say, okay, preacher, I've been thinking about this for a long time. How do I do it? How do I eventually bend the knee? How do I get right with God? How do I get this matter settled? How do I be saved? Well, it says in Romans 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know about you, but I find that wonderful. It doesn't say you've got to do so many good works. It doesn't say you've got to go to so many church services and, and the elders will tick your, your name off as you go through the door on a register. It doesn't say you've got to give so much money to charity. It doesn't say you've got to do so many good deeds for your neighbor. It doesn't say any of those things. It says that you call. And the wonderful thing is, it says, for whosoever shall call, that's you, that's me, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And all of that is because of the blood of Calvary, because of the cross, because of what Christ did in coming down from heaven's glory, living that perfectly righteous life, and then going to the tree, taking those nails in his hands and in his feet taking that crown of thorns upon his brow, the scourging on his back, hanging there, and more than the physical agonies, how he, he bore the wrath of God upon his soul, how he took our hell for us, how he bore our sin upon his own body on the tree. It's because Christ has already done all of the good works necessary for your redemption that all you have to do, and you must do, is call upon the name of the Lord. And you see, my friend, I'm simply appealing to you, if you're still in your sin, then be prepared to bow the knee of submission to him now. Be prepared. Be saved. Prepare to meet thy God. Come to him while there's time. But you know, this verse, as we read it in Romans chapter 14, We've got to remember that it's primarily talking to the believer, primarily talking to the people of God. And how sad it is that often there are Christians with unbended knee. Often there are people that, that are saved people. There's no doubt about that. There are people out there and they're saved and they, they can point a date and a time and they're saved. They could give a word of testimony. They come to church. They do all the things you'd expect of a Christian. And yet truly in their lives, Monday through to Saturday, and even on a Sunday when no one else sees them, largely there is an unbended knee to the will of God. There is not a holy life. There is not a sanctified existence. You know, I believe this is the greatest scourge on Christendom today, on Christ-like Christians. Christians that just don't resemble Christ. In fact, I thought it was interesting that I was listening to a report, I think it was maybe in the British Church newspaper or something like that, and a court case and a Christian. i tell you what it was. It was a politician in the Liberal Democrat Party. Uh, well, I'll not get into that anyway. But a Christian in the Liberal Democrat Party, and he was apparently put out because he was a Christian. And the membership said, you deceived us because you didn't tell us you're a Christian to begin with. And I just thought, isn't it a sad thing when someone's life is so missing Christ and doesn't resemble any holiness whatsoever that the people all around them for months and even years didn't even know they were a Christian. I tell you, friend, if you were to be convicted for being a Christian today, would there be enough evidence against you? Would there be enough evidence saying that person is a child of God, that person read their Bible, that person prayed, that person evangelized, that person went to church, that person, that person did everything you would expect of a believer and more. Oh, the God would make us a holy band of people in Monash Lane. Men and women that are not afraid to bend the knee, bend the knee to Christ. You know, that's what is expected of us. Come with me to Romans 12 and the verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, just back a page, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You see, Paul is pleading with God's people now. He, he's pleading with the church at Rome, quite literally saying, I wish you'd wake up on this issue. He says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. You see, oftentimes we read 
verses. We read sentences in the Bible. You don't often get the emotion behind it. You know when it says, I beseech you, it doesn't say, I'm writing a 30-page report to you in the hope that you might occasionally read it. He's saying, I'm preaching and I'm, I'm impassioned about this issue. And he's saying, I, I'm pleading with you. I beseech you therefore, brethren. And what is he beseeching on the grounds of? By the mercies of God because of all that Christ has done for you on the basis of the shed blood, because of the cross, because of all of those things that Christ has done, by the mercies of God. And look what it says now, verse 1, Romans 12, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. You know when we read that word reasonable, we can read it in the sense that that is that is the bare minimum you should be doing. The bare minimum for God is to live a holy life. Oh, how sad it is when so many aren't living the bare minimum Christian existence for their Savior. But that word reasonable can also be translated as logical. It is your logical service. In other words, when you consider Christ and how he died, when, when you consider his suffering and his agony, when you consider the scourging on his back, when, when you consider for a moment the nails in his hands and feet, when you consider how he wore a crown of thorns, when you consider how they arrayed him in purple and bowed down to him and mocked him, when you consider how he hung upon the tree, and when you consider how he bore our sin upon his body, his own body on the tree, when you consider all of those things that Christ has done, Paul is saying, surely it is your logical service to at least be a holy Christian. But sadly, so many have an unbended knee still in defiance of the word. I ask you, believer, has Christ not done enough for you? Has Christ not done enough for you that you would live for him? The submission. But then I want you to note, secondly, from our verse, the confession. The confession, because something is to be done with our lips. And we find here in our verse, look at the verse 11 of Romans 14. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Look at it, and every tongue shall confess to God. You see, this is what I really love. You know, at one time, and maybe you're in this position now, and I relate this story for your help. At one time, I used to watch the news and worry. At one time, I used to watch the news, read the papers, see all that was going on, and went, oh, nothing will ever change. I wish something would happen. I wish someone would do something. And I used to worry. But you know, even though those things that you see going on in the world may grieve you, and rightly so, I don't worry anymore. Because I've got a grasp of something. That one day, every knee will most definitely bow and one day every tongue shall confess. And however defiant men may be at the moment, however wicked they may be, whatever laws they imagine, whatever, whatever terrible plight they bring against God and his people, I want to tell you this, friend. If God be for us, who can be against us? I tell you this. These men, these women in power may think that they are so mighty. But I tell you, God is mightier still. Don't be worrying. Don't be worrying because one day every tongue shall confess to God. What are they going to confess? Come with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I want everyone to turn here, please. And you, you, you just imagine this for a moment. You think about this. This is going to happen. Every tongue, every tongue confess. You know, James has a lot to say about the tongue. James tells us if you can bridle your tongue, if you control your tongue, you'll be able to control everything. Because the tongue is only a little member, but it's full of fire and it's full of danger. It really is. How many churches have been destroyed because of the tongue? How many congregations have started war at each other because of the tongue? The tongue is a very dangerous thing. It really is. But one day our tongues will be used for the glory of God. And it says in Philippians 2, look at the verses 9 through to 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, the Lord Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that includes every knee, verse 11, and that every tongue should confess. And what are they going to say? What is the confession on their lips? 
should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine that? One day our prime minister, first Hindu prime minister we've had in this country, one day he'll bow the knee and he'll say, Jesus Christ is Lord. What a truth. What a day. You think of all the enemies of Christ in our own province. You think of all the enemies of Christ in our own district. One day every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a day that will be. What a day. You see, something we often forget is the Lord's enemies will be dealt with. They will be dealt with. Come with me to Luke chapter 20, if you would. Luke chapter 20. And this is, I trust it will be a word of encouragement for the believer. Don't despair. Don't despair, friend. One day, all of Christ's enemies will be dealt with. And I look forward to that day. I really do. I look forward to that day. And I give a word of warning. If you're in the congregation today and you're not saved, then you still fall under the classification of being an enemy of Christ. And this verse is applicable to you just as much as to the believer. It says in Luke 20, look at the verses 42 and 43. It says, And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Look at it, verse 43. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. One day all the enemies of Christ will be placed beneath his feet and will be his footstool. And what a wonderful, wonderful day that will be. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to see this. I really do. Because there's a wonderful word here. I've highlighted it before, but I want to highlight it again. And if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I want you to write it down or, or circle it, underline it, do something so that you remember it any time you come to Hebrews chapter 10 to read the Scriptures. Because in Hebrews chapter 10 and the verse 13, we find this wonderful, wonderful word on the same theme as Luke. It says Hebrews 10 verse 13, from henceforth, from henceforth. Now, what's the background? You see, you've got to go to the verse 12 to find the background. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So we're talking about an exalted Jesus Christ now. And look what it says, verse 13. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Underline that word expect. You see, if you expect something, you know it's going to happen. He's not just waiting. He's not just hoping, but he's expecting. He knows it will happen. He knows it's going to happen. There is coming a day when it's as good as a fact in the mind of God. And therefore, for us upon the earth, we are just expecting the enemies to be defeated. That's a wonderful position to be in, you know, to be expecting it. And I tell you this, friend, don't be sad. Don't be sad because there's a wonderful day of submission and confession coming. And I trust you'll remember it and I trust that you'll prepare for it. But then we must keep going. I want you to note, come back with me to Revel uh, Romans 14, sorry. Romans 14. And let's look at the verse 12 now. And let's highlight this. We read in Romans 14 and now the verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. First and foremost, I want to deal with the sinner again. As we've sung, one day we will stand before the judgment bar. The quick, the risen dead, all of us will stand. And I highlighted it deliberately as we've finished singing. I trust that you will be, say, uh, be able to say that, praise God, I'm saved through Jesus' blood. I trust you'll be able to say that. Sadly, so many won't be able to say that as they stand before the judgment bar. So many, they will stand before God and contrary to popular opinion, they will not have a defense. They will not have anything to say. They will be dumbstruck as they stand guilty before God. And we read in Matthew chapter 7. Come there with me, please. We read in Matthew chapter 7 that, that the sinner, the sinner possesses no hope when they stand before the white throne of judgment. You can read all about it in Revelation 20 in your own time this afternoon. Uh, but turn with me to Matthew 7 and the verses 21 through to 23. And you'll find there'll be no excuse that day, but further to this, I want to I warn you. There will, be, there will be people that went to church, stood there, that will be condemned to hell. 
There will be people that went to Monish Lane Free Presbyterian Church that are there and went to hell. There will be people there that know the gospel. I dare say this, unpopular that it may be, there will be men that stood in the pulpit for years that will be there and condemned to hell, not saved. And what do we read here in Matthew 7, verse 21? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's a warning, friend. That's a warning. Almighty God has allowed you today in this building, in this hour, to hear that warning that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. And look at it now. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, only those that have repented and believed the gospel will not fear the judgment seat of Christ. And we read in the verse 22. Look at it. I've underlined it in my Bible. Many will say to me, Underline that word many, if you would. That's a solemn truth. That, that's not talking about a handful of people now. That's talking about a, a, a lot of people. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? What are they saying? We preached. We stood in the pulpit and we preached. We preached sermons. I'm not saying what denomination or anything else. That's for the individual to determine. But there's men here that have preached. Have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name do many wonderful works. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Friend, there is a revelation coming to your soul. I trust it comes now before the day when it's too late. But friend, if you're still a sinner, it doesn't matter how many times you came to Monish Lane Free Church. It doesn't matter how many times you sat in the meetings. It doesn't matter how many times you read your Bible. It doesn't matter how many times you gave to charity. It doesn't matter how many times you did good works. It doesn't matter how many times you did anything, even in the Savior's name. The Bible tells us if you're not saved, then you will be cast off. And the Word of God tells us, so then every one of us should give account of himself to God. And that's a warning, sinner. But then for the believer, come back with me to Romans 14. I've already said this, but Romans 14 is primarily for the Christian. It's talking about the believer. We find Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He's talking about Christians. And he warns the Christians, saying, so then every one of us should give account of himself to God. You see, the judgment seat of Christ for the Christian, it's not about sin. Your sin is paid for. Your sin is gone, Christian. Your sin has been cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. It's covered beneath the blood. Your sin is gone. You will not stand before Christ in judgment concerning sin, but you will stand before God concerning sanctification, concerning whether you were as holy as you should have been, concerning missed opportunities, concerning that family member that you had years to tell the gospel to and yet you were too scared to, concerning that work colleague that you may have worked alongside for decades and yet time and time again you refused to tell them of Christ, concerning that man on the bus that you only knew for five minutes yet you talked about the weather and the football and anything else but you didn't talk about Christ, concerning about all those things, friend, you'll stand before Christ and we will give an account of that. And Paul is saying concerning the squabbling in the church, concerning what you can eat and you can't eat and what day to observe and all the rest of it. He's saying you will all stand before God. We've given account of ourselves to God. And you know, friend, we need to remember. We need to remember that's a very solemn thing. Now, I hope and pray that as we stand before God, you will be able to be a believer that says, well, I, I stood for God and the world hated me for it. But praise God, that day I was vindicated. That day the truth went out. And the truth came out and became public. And everyone knew, the world around, of every generation that has ever existed upon the globe, the truth went out and they all will know that I stood for God. But I tell you this, there'll be some believers. And it'll be an embarrassing day, I believe. Be a day when so many missed opportunities will be listed. So many. Praise God, they're all under the blood. But still, there'll not be a good time. I tell you, friend, it's serious. And I trust we will remember. 
whatever position your soul is in, whether you're saved, whether you're unsaved, whatever your heart's condition, whether you're in the right or even in the wrong over certain things at the moment, I want us to remember this. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. The truth will out. And I ask, are you ready for that day? Are you prepared? Is your sin covered beneath the blood, friend? Are you saved? And if you are saved, are you living for Christ? I urge you, Christian, I urge you, be busy for God. Don't be ashamed. Be one that stands for truth, even if no one will stand with you. But sinner, I appeal to your heart, especially today. Sinner, get saved. Bend the knee of submission while there's time. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Repent and believe the gospel. Come to the Savior and know I needn't worry any longer because I am going to the glory. Be saved. Be saved. But let us remember this, that the truth will out. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself. To God. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Let's still ourselves in the Master's presence for a moment. And I just want to use this moment to see the Word of God applied to your heart, friend. I, I trust. I trust you'll not just close over your Bible and forget what's been said. Will you be a doer of the word today? Maybe there's someone here and you're still in your sin. You know you need to be saved. You know you need to trust Christ. Come to him now. Be saved now. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Be saved now. And I urge you, be saved now and then tell someone that you're saved. Stop being a witness for Christ. But Christian, are you being as holy as you should be? Are you being the Christian that Christ saved you to be? Or if someone looked at your life, are you an unchristlike Christian? You don't resemble Christ at all. Let's settle these matters before the throne now. Let's deal with them. Heavenly Father, bless thy word to every heart. Help us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. And help us to live in light of the fact that we will stand before Christ one day. And help us to remember that every one of us should give account of himself to God. Bless us now. Take us to our homes in safety. Help us even on the slippery surfaces and all those things. We mean it, Lord. We don't take these things for granted. Take us to our homes in safety. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.